Good afternoon. Rajib Taib Erdogan, in 1997, he was sentenced to four years in jail for reciting a poem which basically said that the mosques are our fortresses, the domes of the mosques are our shields, and the minarets are our spears in the fight against secularism. Uh, the military and the courts did not take kindly to that. <clears throat> he was sentenced to four years. At the time, he was serving as the mayor of Istanbul, and he was doing a very good job. Uh, he had broad-based uh, housing construction. Uh, he had distributed the water and the electricity a lot better than before. He was considered a success. He was a member of the Welfare Party at the time on the national level. The Welfare Party was the fifth and final of the Islamist parties that had been started in the 1970s and had continued up through the 1990s. The Welfare Party, along with all of the others, had eventually been banned by the military and the courts from participating in, in political affairs. And that's exactly what happened in 1997. Erdogan went to jail. The country moved into a goofy coalition arrangement and ended up uh, almost bankrupt and on the verge of, of uh, significant political unrest. In 2001, Mr. Erdogan, who actually only served nine months in jail before he got out, he was also banned for life from political activities in Turkey, but he uh, nevertheless managed, along with a couple of his friends, to start a new political party it was called the AKP, the Adalet Ve Kalkan Ma Partisi, which stands for Justice and Development, and has absolutely nothing to do in its charter with Islam. Uh, the party uh, ran in the parliamentary elections in uh, 2002 and won 37% of the popular vote, which is the largest plurality that any political party had achieved in Turkey since the early 80s. And because of the electoral system in Turkey, which does not allow parties to be seated unless they receive 10% of the popular vote, he ended up with a parliamentary majority. And uh, he was elected to the prime ministership after that parliament lifted the ban on politics. And he served for 11 years as the prime minister. And then in 2014, he was elected president and he is serving as the president of the Turkish Republic as we speak. He's been in charge effectively for the last 15 years. For him, democracy first and foremost was free and fair elections. He learned very early on how to win elections. Uh, he won in 2003, as I said, with 37 percent of the vote. And let's see. And then he won again in 2007 with 47 percent of the popular vote. In 2011, with 49% of the popular vote, all astounding in a country, in a multi-party parliamentary system. In 2014, because he could not run for delegate in the parliament again, by law, he decided that he wanted to be president, which was largely at that time a ceremonial post. He was elected president and has immediately converted that post to the head of head of government, and he is essentially the head of government today. He won that vote by 51.8%. In June of 2015, <clears throat> the parliamentary elections were again held. Now Erdogan is not a part of the party, and they lost. They went to 41% in the popular vote and lost their parliamentary ma majority in the process. Uh, there's reasons for that, which I'll explain later. Because there was no coalition that was formed in 2000, November of 2015, there was a snap election, what they call a called or snapped election. And again, the AKP, the Adalet and Kalkan Ma Partisi, got 49% and had a parliamentary majority. The next election is scheduled for November 5th, uh, 2019, when both the president and the parliamentary election will occur simultaneously. In addition to the elections that he won, he also was very good at getting constitutional amendments passed via referendum. And he, there were three of them in this time frame. 2007, the direct election of the president in a five-year term, and he could serve two five-year terms. 
69% of the popular vote. In 2010, a biggie, civil court jurisdiction over the military, and particularly in terms of crimes against the state, which included coup plotting. Those of you who know the history of Turkey know that the military intervened four different times in the political processes from 60 right straight through 97. And uh, this was now considered to be a crime against the state and chargeable in civilian courts. And that had repercussions, which I'll talk about in a minute. 2017, last April was the biggie. This was essentially a rewrite of the 1982 constitution uh, 21 amendments. Uh, amongst all of the detail, there was essentially converting the form of government from a parliamentary system to a strong executive uh, presidency. Uh, that was accomplished along with abolishing the prime minister's post. Uh, vice presidents can be appointed by the president. Parliament serves a five-year term to coincide with the presidential term. And the president gets significant power in appointing judges to the judiciary. 12 of the 15 are presidential appointments, three are parliamentary appointments. The president in this system will be the head of state, the head of government, and can be allowable the head of party. So Rajiv Tayyip Erdogan, RTE, I will refer to, refer to him, is all three. He's the head of state, the head of government, and the head of his party. He is Alpha Omega when it comes to government and party actions. Uh, he has developed, and I'll talk about this more later on, what we call the cult of personality. Uh, he has replaced almost all the isms, the Islamism, the social conservatism, the neo-Ottomanism, the nationalism. That's all now amalgamated into Erdoganism, and Erdoganism is the current uh, administration in Turkey and likely to continue so. All he has to do is keep winning elections. I'm going to start, talk about seven different or several different topic areas. These are those topic areas, 12 of them, and I'm going to stick to my notes because I want to get through it in the 50 minute allotted time frame. Um, and I'll show each one of these individually. And then I'll put this slide back up at the question and answer period so to remind you what I may have said something about. <clears throat> I'm going to start with Fatula Galen. This is interesting because um, the Turkish forums here in the United States don't want to talk about Fatula Galen, um, just maybe because they want to remain, uh, have some access to the Turkish government. Fethullah Gulen, since the 1970s, uh, when he started, was a charismatic Islamic preacher in Turkey. Uh, he attracted significant crowds for his Friday sermons, so much so that they began to be broadcast on the radio and television networks. He reached out throughout Turkey. He preached a tolerant Islam, which focused on the poor and charity work and education, <clears throat> including female education. He had a very strong following throughout Turkey, um, all the way through the 90s. Uh, he established a network of followers, which he called Hizmet. Hizmet is the Turkish word for service. Rotary, the public word, is service. I mean, same idea. Um, he released, received a lot of financial support from small entrepreneurial establishments throughout Turkey. Um, he started schools. He had media outlets that were specifically owned by him. He encouraged his followers to enter the judici judiciary, the AG offices, the attorney general's offices, and the police. Um, basically, his philosophy was anti-Kemalist. He was not a follower of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. And it was anti-military, definitively anti-military in these military interventions into politics. He never started or he never joined a political party. He tried to stay out of political politics. Um, having said that, he liked Mr. Erdogan a lot, and he felt that he and Mr. Erdogan had similar points of view. And in the late 1990s, about the time that he got out of jail, Erdogan got out of jail, 
they aligned fairly closely. Um, in 1999, Gulen, who had been right one step ahead of the military uh, all along, was about to be arrested. <clears throat> he, um, with help of U.S. State Department and the agency, relocated to Pennsylvania and up near the Poconos in a 400-acre compound up there, well guarded, and he's still there today. His uh, international network has grown enormously since he's been in Pennsylvania. He has now has schools and charities in 70 countries around the world. He has 120 charter schools in the United States. Um, he, um, he, and his network has grown not only in Turkey, but throughout the, throughout the world. Um, he was a key player in the 2010-2012 military trials, which I'll get to here in a minute. And at the same time that that was going on, he and, and Erdogan began to have a falling out, which ended up very badly in 2012 and 2013. And uh, at this point in time, they are not only rivals, they are enemies. And uh, RTE is basically uh, called the, the Galenist traitors uh, to the cause. There's no question about the fact that two coup attempts in 2013 and 2016 were engineered either directly by Galen or at least by his network. Democracy. At the beginning, Erdogan was the model for a modern Islamic democratic state. He, uh, number one, revived the economy. The economy was, as I said, in very bad shape in, in 2002. Uh, he worked hard to get the economy back working so that the impact on the people would be better. He reduced inflation to 9%, which sounds like a lot, but it was 35%. He uh, increased the per capita GDP. He paid off the IMF loans. The valuation of the lira continued to grow versus the dollar and other currencies. Um, <clears throat> and the debt versus the GDP was only 30%, which is a lot better than we're doing. Um, he also initiated a, a democratic initiative. Uh, he passed a labor law that was very favorable for employees, 45-hour uh, work week, uh, the right to complain, and absolutely uh, forbid any kind of discrimination in the workplace uh, by gender or any other, any other significant difference. Uh, as I said, by 2010, the Gulen relations had, uh, had soured. And I should say also that one of the inspirations for his democratic initiative was the desire to join the EU, the European Union, and European Union accession talks began in 2005. <clears throat> By 2010, they were on the rocks, and uh, Erdogan became increasingly authoritarian and less concerned about uh, democratic uh, nuances, which would be things like freedom of press and freedom of assembly. And he became more authoritarian. And this is when the cult of personality or Erdoism uh, grew. And of course, from 2016 to a day before yesterday, when it was renewed again, uh, the state of emergency has existed in Turkey, where basically all human rights are, are subverted. Military trials in 2010 and uh, through 2012, <coughs> the referendum that had passed, the constitutional referendum allowing the military to be tried in the civil courts, was immediately invoked by the prosecutorial uh, groups in Istanbul. 217 military officers were detained, 75 were tried and sentenced, <coughs> and most of those sentences were life sentences for coup plotting, including Ilker Bashbu, who was a close personal friend of mine. He was a captain when I met him. I was a major. He, uh, he ended up as the chief of the Turkish general staff for a couple of years. Very, very, very smart guy. He knew more about the American Civil War than I do. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, when the trials occurred in 2010 and 2012, the government, Erdogan, did not intervene. He allowed those trials to go forward. They were all engineered and controlled by Gulenists, uh, who had a very, very significant anti-military uh, 
approach to the thing, and that's what happened in 2010, 2011. Incidentally, I was in Turkey in October 2013, and I met with uh, two of the families of these five general officers who were in jail, friends of mine, and then in 2014, they were released. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Gezi Park, a patch of green in downtown Istanbul, less than a kilometer square. I walked it in October of 2013, side to side and front to back, and took about 15 minutes. Uh, it's right downtown Istanbul, it's where Hotel Row is, where Divan and the Hilton and the Radisson and the Marriott, these huge structures are, are there. It's right next to Taksim Square, and for those of you who've been in Istanbul, it's the big Ataturk statue square right in the downtown area. And immediately adjacent to Istiklal Jadisi, the Independence Avenue, which is where all the great restaurants and shops, and it's a walking street, there's no cars that go up and down and it's, uh, it fans out throughout that neighborhood. It's, it's really a neat, neat place. But anyway, there's this little patch of green there. One of the things Erdogan had done is he had allowed the construction, public construction projects to go on and the, the private contractors, many of whom were closely aligned with Mr. Erdogan's politics, to be involved in the construction of these various different edifices. And somebody, made a suggestion that Gezi Park, this little patch in downtown is be raised and a shopping mall and luxury apartments in a building in the style of an Ottoman barracks. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, folks. This, this is true. Uh, be erected in, in where Gezi Park was. So on, uh, there was a small environmental movement in Turkey at the time, not significant, but um, nevertheless, a, a small group of tree huggers, so to speak. So on the 27th of May, there, was 50, there were 50 environmentalists in the park uh, who were there because they were supposed to raise the park the next day with bulldozers. The police responded overwhelmingly. Water cannons, tear gas, and this iconic photograph of the lady in red uh, standing there being sprayed within, what, 10 feet or 6 feet by a policeman in, uh, with a tear gas. Uh, that picture went viral um, pretty much the next day. That 50-person demonstration had turned into multi-thousands, and now the complainers were not necessarily environmentalists, but they were people who were complaining about the Erdogan regime in its entirety. Um, the police on May 31st tried to eliminate that crowd. Of course, needless to say, they got nowhere. And in the height of it, the LGBT parade, which normally attracted about 3,000 people in Istanbul, is scheduled to march through Taksim, and they do, and they are 100,000 strong. So it gives you a kind of a reflection of the unrest that was going on in 2013. The demonstration sp spread to every urban area in Turkey, and it was estimated that there were 2.5 million people who were demonstrating one way or another. Needless to say, <clears throat> the Gezi Park project was put on hold and it is still on hold. That seemed to take the steam out of the demonstrators at the moment who didn't know what else to do, and uh, so it, it died down. But RTE, uh, Erdogan, uh, took it personally. As far as he was concerned, it was a, a, another personal affront, and he was very good at, at seeing things that way. Uh, and it was, to some extent, the harbinger of things to come as far as protests were concerned but RTE definitely came out of the Gezi Park thing, and still to this day, he complains about it. The Kurds, the PKK, and the HDP. Well, there's 20 million Kurdish people who live in Turkey. Well, 16 to 20 million, depending on who you're talking to, maybe more. Um, the PKK is an armed militant group that has, has, fo has focused on uh, 
Kurdish nationalism. They began a war against the Turkish military in 1984. It's ongoing today. Um, and HDP is a new character player in this. That's the Halk Demokrasi Partisi, the People's and Democratic Party. This is a Kurdish founded and led a political party, which nobody had ever seen before in Turkey, but they got involved. In uh, 2011, uh, RTE, Erdogan, in terms of the political support, looked around and realized that Mr. Gulen and his followers were probably not going to be on his side any longer, and he thought perhaps the Kurds might come to the AKP side of the political spectrum. He began negotiations with the PKK in 2013 and declared a truce. The elections in 2015, in June of 2015, brought that to an end quickly because the HDP, or the Kurds rather, not only didn't support the AKP, but they formed their own political party, the HDP, and now all of a sudden they had seats in parliament, which would be unheard of. They passed the 10% minimal level. So instead of garnering support, the AKP lost support. Erdogan realized that. Uh, there was a ISIS bombing in Ankara of a Kurdish meeting. 117 people were killed. The PKK, in a desperation dumb move, this is Mr. Demirtas, who is the head of the HDP, the, the, the Kurdish party, with the Kurdish scarf around his neck. <clears throat> and, oops, I'm going too fast here. All right. Anyway, um, the PKK decided to uh, punish the Turkish military because they had not protected the Kurdish meeting in Ankara, and they assassinated a few police officers in the east, and that was it as far as Erdogan is concerned. He resumed the war in its full flight and um, in the June or July of 2015. The snap elections in, 2000, in November of 2015 now attracted the nationalists because Erdogan was again fighting the Kurds and uh, he was able to regain his majority. Okay, the corruption coup in 2013. In 2013, at the end, this was after the Gezi Park thing and after I had been in Turkey. I was there in October of 2013. This happened in December of 2013. Indictments were issued on December 25th, or December 23rd, for a significant number of people, high-ranking people, important people, for corruption. And they were arrested. And it involved a trading scheme that was set up by this man, uh, Riza Zareb, for trading gold to Iran for gas and oil imports, which were then further imparted from Turkey. And it was all done through the state bank, the Halk Bankasa, <clears throat> and a clear violation of US sanctions on Iran before the nuclear treaty. Um, the U.S. Uh, immediately reacted to uh, this event, but more importantly, the Gulenists who were in charge of the prosecutorial forces, as I say, they arrested some important people, including one cabinet minister, his son, the sons of two other cabinet ministers, the general manager of the Halkbankasa, the state bank, uh, and Mr. Zaret were all arrested and accused of corruption, money laundering. There was an enormous amount of cash that was floating around in this whole, whole deal. When the police went into the apartment of the general manager of the Hawk Bank, there was $5 million in cash in shoe boxes underneath his, now not, not exactly a great bank model, I would say. <laughs> but just to give you an example of the amount of corruption that was involved. Um, three days later, there was another indictment about to be issued. It was, it was leaked to the press, and it involved both of Erdogan's sons who were in business and associated with the government, and there was a wiretapped conversation, illegal of course, 
that was broadcast on Facebook throughout Turkey of Erdogan saying to his son, get rid of the millions of dollars of cash you guys have got laying around. Well, what happened? The second indictment was never issued. The Erdogan government stepped in vigorously. It fired and transferred and replaced all of the prosecutors and judges and police authorities who were involved in this corruption scheme. He quashed the indictment once and for all. Um, RTE, Erdogan, blamed Gulen for the whole thing, said the whole thing was made up by the Gulenists as a coup action against the government. And the majority of the Turkish people accepted that explanation, which mind boggling. Uh, I do believe that it was a coup attempt. Uh, I also believe that uh, that a lot of the corruption activities were true and it would come up again because Mr. Zareb ended up in jail in Manhattan and was tried recently, and I'll tell you more about that when I get to it. As a, an aside here, I would note that in the 2014 time frame then, um, Mr. Erdogan realized that the same prosecutors and judges who had accused him and his government of corruption were the ones who had tried the military in 2010 and 2012. He fired all of them, and then he said that the, uh, the evidence in the military trials was manufactured, which a lot of it was, uh, and he released from prison the Turkish officers who had been held. Now, interestingly enough, he did not pardon them. He released them from jail under recognizance and what have you, and that's the status that they remain in today, and I'm still in touch with several of them, and and when I ask what's going on, they say, we have no idea. Um, so that was the 2013 coup. There was another coup in 2016. This now involved the military. The 2013 coup had nothing to do with the military or anything to do with it. I would argue that the 2016 didn't really have much to do with the military either. Um, but it was conducted with military means. It was almost certainly inspired by the Gulen movement and by the Gulenists in the military, um, those that were left, and many of them felt that their time was short before they were fired or unearthed or whatever, and probably felt that a coup was their last choice. I do not believe that Mr. Gulen himself commanded and controlled the coup attempt, but certainly the Gulenists were involved in the in the attempt. It went early because the MIT, the military, East, uh, the CIA, the CIA of Turkey uh, discovered the coup was about to occur in the late afternoon, early evening of July 15th. Um, they put a word out and the, the uh, coupists went early. They were supposed to do, initiate actions about 2.33 in the morning. They started about 11.30 at night, which was too early. Not too many had gone to bed. Uh, there were over 300 people killed in this thing. It was not an inconsequential action. Uh, there were tanks, and the, the, uh, the Air Force was particularly involved, or an element of the Air Force was particularly involved, bombed the Parliament building and the, uh, mili the uh, CIA headquarters, the intelligence headquarters, what I'm trying to say. Um, they sent special forces to Marmaris, where Mr. Erdogan was on vacation, uh, probably to, they say, to capture him, I think, to assassinate him. He got the word from his brother-in-law, of all sources, that something was going on and he needed to get out of there. He went and jumped in an airplane and they flew around in the skies for about four and a half hours before he managed to land at, at Istanbul and address the people. Um, Erdogan ended up, as you can see, it was fairly violent in Istanbul. There are bodies laying there. On, there are bodies laying there on the ground. But Mr. Erdogan landed in Istanbul in the early morning hours. He was able to address the, Amer the Turkish people through CNN Turkey, and uh, and they broadcast it. And by 10 o'clock in the morning the next day. Uh, the coup was over. Uh, the people had 
taken to the streets, millions of them, to confront the coupists and the military forces per Mr. Erdogan's call for the people to take to the streets, which they did. Um, Erdogan immediately blamed, quote, those in Pennsylvania for the coup attempt. Two days later, a state of emergency was passed by the parliament and continues to today. And as I said before, I, uh, I, do, I do believe that uh, while the Galenists were involved in the coup, I don't think Mr. Galen was directly controlling it. Nevertheless, Erdogan requested Gulen's extradition, and that process is ongoing, and I will talk about that in a minute. It nevertheless further uh, established uh, Erdogan's authoritarianism and his right to ignore uh, basic human rights and due process. In the aftermath of the coup, purges. First and foremost, the Gulenists. Uh, and there was a very broad brush treatment to, to this whole title of being a Gulenist. It began to look like he was in fact going after critics and political opponents. He definitely went after the media. There are 147 journalists in jail in Turkey right now who were arrested in that time frame. That's more than any other country in the world except China. The Jumhuriyet newspaper, which was a a uh, very strongly political newspaper, but tried to maintain a sense of neutrality. Uh, uh, 13 of their editors and prominent writers were uh, jailed, and there are three of them still jailed, include the editor-in-chief. Numerous TV stations and media outlets were closed. Um, and a significant increase at the same time in state media outlets, those who were uh, absolutely parroting and not very strong on fact-checking uh, were reporting uh, the AKP line, the Erdogan line. In the civil service, 120,000 people were dismissed from jobs without pension. Um, the judiciary, prosecutors, senior police, 14,000 were purged. In the education element, professors, administrators, 10,000 were purged, including literally the head of every university in Turkey. The government ministries were significantly purged. 40% of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was dismissed overnight. And, and similar numbers in all of the other ministries of the government, where Gulenists had penetrated, perhaps. Uh, interestingly, a significant number of personal aides, these military or civilian guys who specialize in being an aide to somebody important, whether it be a head of a ministry or a, a general officer or the president himself, were arrested and dismissed, including the president's one, uh, his military aide was also included. In the military, 47% of all the officers were immediately cashiered. And that included 70% of active duty military pilots, Air Force pilots. For about an eight or nine month period of time after the coup, they could not fly their airplanes. Um, NATO and US assigned officers sought asylum by the hundreds, uh, including the student who was here at the War College, 2016, he arrived in July. At the end of July, he received notice to return to Turkey, and he did not go. And he, he and the Air War College student and a group down in Norfolk gathered together. And as far as I know, most of them have received political asylum at this point in time. Incidentally, he left his family in Turkey. Um, so that uh, kind of was the aftermath of these coups. Uh, the political parties, the AKP itself, had to purge its, some of its membership. They did so very quietly because they certainly didn't want that in the press. But other political parties have been targeted. The head of the HDP, the picture I showed you of Demirtas, he's in jail. He's been there for the last 11 months. He hasn't been charged, even though the accusation is that he was uh, supporting the PKK as a terrorist. 
um, the head of the major political party, uh, the main opposition party has been called a traitor, the CHP has been called a traitor and supporting t terrorism. And the bottom line is that the cabinet, the judiciary, the legislative, the executive branch have all been brought under the absolute control of Mr. Erdogan. All the isms are out, Erdoism is in, and as I said before, without checks and balances, but winning free elections, he can continue off in office until 2029, uh, 11 years from now. All right, let me take a quick look at Turkey's foreign relationships. Uh, EU, I think I said in the lecture here three years ago when I talked about Turkey that that the chance of Turkey getting to the EU was zero and none, it's worse now. So, <clears throat> Even though Turkey's most important trade and investment partners are in Europe, outside of those uh, activities, the situation in the relationship with Europe couldn't be worse. Um, there are 28 countries in the EU, and accession to any new member requires unanimous approval of all 28 countries. That is ludicrous to even think about in the current environment because the bilateral relations between Turkey and many of these countries is absolutely on the rocks. Cyprus, France, Holland, Germany, Austria, Denmark, none of them would support Turkish accession, and everybody else is probably the same. <clears throat> the exception, the, the greatest supporter for Turkey is the Great Great Britain, and of course they're leaving the EU as we speak. So uh, RTE, Erdogan, has called the European Union a Christian club, and it doesn't want any Islamic members or Muslim members, and I think that's true. And then he says Turkey will not beg to join. Both Macron from France and Merkel and Germany have suggested a different category for relationship with the EU, which would not include membership, but would provide customs union, labor relations, and uh, basic uh, trade arrangements. And the Erdogan government has said they're not interested in a lesser status. Okay. German relations, um, equally bad, if not worse, and Merkel's problems with developing a government at the present time is not helping, although Andrea Merkel is not a supporter of Turkey. In this April constitutional re referendum, Erdogan and several of his ministers wanted to come to Germany. There's three million Turks living there, voting Turkish citizens living in Germany. And they wanted to campaign among them for this constitutional referendum. And the government of Germany said no, political rallies can be held in Germany, having to do with the politics of another country. Uh, Erdogan again responded in his normal diplomatic self by saying that the uh, German authorities that made that decision were Nazis. Uh, about the same time, the German uh, intelligence service said that it found no direct linkage of Gulen to the coup attempt, and all of which uh, led RTE to have a very cool opinion about the Germans, and vice versa. All right. I put down all these abbreviations because trying to understand this is impossible. Impossible. It is, it is alphabet soup, number one. And number two, the competing interests here are just incredible. This very morning, I'm sitting watching the, the feeds from Turkey to see if Turkey has, in fact, invaded Syria this morning because the the potential for them to intervene in the Kurdish movement into the Afran area, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, they, the, the chief of the Turkish army general staff and the chief of the intelligence organization were in Moscow yesterday getting permission from the Russians to conduct this operation. The FSA, the Free Syrian Army, is a Turkish-backed rebel group that probably includes al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. The SDF is the U.S.-backed security, security, Syrian Defense Force, which is 90% made up of the Kurdish forces, which are the YPG, that's the Syrian Kurdish fighters. The PKK is in Turkey, but the 
Turkish government says that the YPG, the Syrian Kurdish fighters, are nothing more than an extension of the PKK. Syrian government forces under Bashar al-Assad, and you have to remember that this whole thing started with a civil war in 2011, uh, have become much stronger because of the tutelage and support of Iran and Russia. Uh, the Hezbollah from Iran, uh, from Lebanon, has been in Syria now for the last four years. Uh, so you have both the civil war ongoing and you have the remnants of the ISIS war still going on. That may come to a conclusion, but that doesn't mean that radical Islamist movements are going to disappear. Uh, they aren't, and there may be a resurgence of al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. The Turks have been very wary of Syria and the Syrian Kurds since the mid-1980s. Uh, in 2001, at the time of the Arab Spring, Erdogan had a vision of himself as a uh, pan-Ottoman leader, and needless to say, the Arabs were not terribly fond of that idea. Uh, but anyway, he called for Assad's departure. Um, in 2014, when ISIS invaded and took over half of Syria, headquartered in Raqqa, uh, the Turkish military did not directly respond other than protecting their borders. Uh, and in fact, the, the accusation was made that Turkey's borders were in fact fairly porous in allowing uh, rebels to uh, cross into, into, and it would include ISIS and Al-Qaeda and al-Nusra to cross into Syria. Uh, in 2016, the U.S. Got, military got involved. Uh, the Obama administration had been reluctant to put any military on the ground there. Uh, in 2016, that changed, and uh, <clears throat> they did get involved. Uh, aircraft from Injerlik and drones from Injerlik were uh, used. Uh, the special forces, the U.S. special forces that were put on the ground, discovered that the YPG was the best Kurdish was the best fighting force of any of the fighting forces in Syria and supported them in the Raqqa campaign to get rid of ISIS in Syria. Um, so the Raqqa campaign, the victory over ISIS, or its so-called victory over ISIS. So what's, what's going on now? Assad wants a unified Syria. Bashar al-Assad wants a unified Syria, period. Russia and Iran are supporting him. Uh, Turkey wants Assad gone, but Turkey is much more concerned about the Kurds in northern Syria than they are about Bashar al-Assad at this point in time. Um, and they are threatening the invasion of the Afran Peninsula as we speak. The U.S. is supporting the YPG and may have special forces on the ground in that area. This is the, uh, the Kurdish YPG force. The front row is all women. About 30% of the active combat force is women. And this is the area, I don't have a pointer here, but the, the, yellow, the, the yellow controlled area, which is all 500 miles of the Syrian border with Turkey for all practical purposes, is Kurdish controlled. And that yellow patch to the left, which is adjacent to the Hatay Peninsula of Turkey, is where the Af Afran operation is likely to occur. Okay. Last but not least. Well, it's been variously, dis well, let me, historically, the Cold War provided the impetus for close relations between Turkey and the United States. The Turks were afraid of the USSR and the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits, and they came together and 1947 and stayed together, I would argue, until 1989 when the Soviet Union went away. With that impetus more or less gone at that point in time, uh, nevertheless, the geostrategic importance of Turkey, of where they are, who their neighbors were, the neighborhood they were in was extremely important to the U.S., both in terms of projection of power and in terms of projection of um, democracy or whatever you want to call it, whatever our foreign policy was advocating. There was a very strong military to military relationship, which I have gone back and thought about a lot and re-examined because I was a part of it. And I realize now that we did a lot wrong and that we were blinding ourselves to some imperatives that we should have paid attention to with regards to the military role in, in Turkey. 
uh, and for too long, I think we were their unabashed supporters. Um, and Injerlik, which is which was the, the air base down in the southeastern part of Turkey, remains important in the fighting going on today. Um, so the current status of the relationship, it's been variously described as broken, tattered, in shambles, a black hole on the rocks, and cannot be repaired. In June of 2017, a survey in Turkey was taken, broad-based surveys throughout the country, which basically asked the individual Turk to say what was the greatest security threat to Turkey. 72% of them said the United States. The United States reputation, if you will, with the Turkish public is abjectly bad at this point in time. And it is reflective of the government's attitude as well. Uh, in 2003, when the U.S. 4th Division wanted to invade Turkey, or wanted to invade Iraq through Turkey, the Turkish government said no, and the desops portion of our military strategy have from that time on never forgiven them and considered Turkey an unreliable ally. So from the U.S., from the Turkish perspective, U.S. support for the YPG, the, that is the Kurdish military in Syria, is the biggest problem. It is ongoing. It is potentially explosive. Second issue is Gulen. Uh, the extradition proceeding is ongoing but strikes me as being unlikely, simply because, amongst other things, any extradition has to assure that the person being extradited will be given a fair trial in the country to whom they are being extradited. That seems significantly unlikely. Although I did have a, a State Department insider inform me that the Justice Department is, re, is uh, allocating more resources to this extradition request than any extradition request they've received since the Shah of Iran. So that's fairly significant. The third factor is that Erdogan and his ministers, his prime minister, his deputy prime minister, his justice minister, his foreign minister, have been incredibly intemperate in their public comments. Uh, a lot of it is perhaps for domestic consumption, but all of it appears in the New York Times. And while there has not been any reaction to all of that language, calling the US terrorist supporters and broken justice system and what have you, um, nevertheless, again, an insider has informed me that the staffers on the Hill, both Senate and House, are unified in their very, very poor opinion of Turkey and any favorable action that would need to occur in the Congress of the U.S. is extremely unlikely. Uh, other stuff, Erdogan visited the United States in September last year uh, for a meeting with Trump. Nothing happened. Um, he returned to the embassy that afternoon. There were about 100 demonstrators across the street from the Turkish embassy. Uh, the police had a line established and the demonstrators were behind it. Um, they got out of their cars in front of the embassy and Erdogan's security detail, plus a couple others, walked across the street and confronted the protesters and then proceeded to beat the hell out of them with clubs and kicking and they were a very uh, well-trained force and they, they basically uh, brutally attacked the demonstrators. It was all captured on film uh, it was in, on all the Washington, D.C. news channels that evening and then went uh, national in the United States. Subsequently, 12 members of the security detail, they were all back in Turkey, of course, but were, uh, arrest warrants were issued for them. Uh, Erdogan did not take kindly to that. He said that the fascist D.C. police had refused to accept the responsibility for protecting the Turkish embassy. Um, Incidentally, when, when Erdogan came back for the UN meetings in November, he had a different security detail with him, not, not any of these guys. Two longtime Turkish citizens who were employed by the American consulates in Izmir and Istanbul um, were recently arrested and 
put in jail and charged as terrorists. The American ambassador conducted an interview thereafter and said that this was not justice, this was vengeance. Um, and, oh, by the way, there will no, no longer be any processing of non-immigrant visas to the United States. He apparently did that, Erdogan says he did that on his own, he didn't, he did that with State Department blessing. Uh, Turkey responded by cutting off all non-immigrant visas to Turkey, and for three months that continued, and that was finally resolved about just before Christmas of this year. There hasn't been an American ambassador in Turkey since September, and as far as I know, no one has been nominated or is being considered to be the U.S. ambassador to Turkey. Riza Zareb, that guy who I told you, the gold trader, uh, he, um, he was captured in Miami in 2016 with his family. They were visiting Disney World. Dumb, dumb, dumb. He was, he was brought to Manhattan. He was charged with violating U.S. sanctions on Iran. Uh, he was brought up on charges. The Erdogan government wanted him immediately released. And uh, the U.S. said, no, he's going to be, go through the court system. Then in November... He disappeared, and he turned up as a prosecution for, the, or as a witness for the prosecution. And there was one other Turk that was in the United States who was also arrested at the same time. <clears throat> Zareb testified against him, um, and he was convicted. And we are waiting on the sentencing. If the sentencing is severe, then the U.S. Congress could place sanctions on the Turkish Halkbankasa which would be unbelievable. Um, nobody knows where Zareb is at the moment. He's disappeared. He's probably in witness protection somewhere. Uh, he gave up, he says, $150 million to turn prosecution witness. And last but not least, by any means, Jerusalem. Uh, the designation of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel by the Trump administration has caused a cataclysm throughout the Middle East, but nowhere any stronger than in, than in Ankara. The State Department says in soothing diplomatic tones, the long-term strategic relationship uh, with common interests will continue strong and not be disrupted by these current differences. McMaster, in December, quote, Turkey and Gutter are the main sponsor of radicalism, and Turkey's troubles are the fault of, RT, of, of Erdogan and the AKP. A few days later, he said, the U.S. has long supported and will continue to support Turkey. I, like President Trump, am a firm believer in a strong alliance with U.S. and Turkey. He did not apologize for his remarks. Turkish foreign minister acknowledged his remarks, quote, with sadness, unquote, and he, quote, must have known better, unquote, and, quote, his baseless claims are far beyond reality, astonishing, and unacceptable, unquote. The bottom line, like his approach to domestic politics, his foreign policy, that's Erdogan's foreign policy, will be based on his own perceptions, reactions, and biases. There is no check or balance on his power at this point in time, and as far as we can tell, there's nobody really even talking to him. I have an article from Middle East Institute which claims that. Um, I, in this terms, you understand, he has embarked on a Turkey first policy, very strong. Um, he can remain in office until 2029 if he's elected president in 2019. It's likely that those elections will be brought back to July of 2018, this year. And so he can remain in office till 29, 2020. 20, 20. I do not see much likelihood of an accommodation, a favorable accommodation in U.S. Turkish relations through that time frame. Break time. Take a break. Let me show you one more slide here. Okay, when I gave this lecture three years ago on Turkey, 
somebody, well, maybe it was the radical, the sectarianism lecture, I can't remember. But somebody asked, so what's the solution to the Middle East? <laughs> okay. And I said, unequivocally, I said it's women. The women need to assert themselves. If there were a feminine approach to relationships at, in the intra-country and inter-country level, we wouldn't have all this fighting and war. And I, I firmly believe that. Okay, this guy is Kadri Gersel. He has, he has just been released from prison. He's one of the uh, editors of the Jumhuriyet uh, newspaper. He's just been released from prison. He's standing outside of the bus that just released him, and his wife is greeting him, okay? That's a nice greeting. But the expression I want you to look at is the expression of the special forces soldier on the side. <laughs> He is thinking, this is probably a pretty good deal, <laughs> pretty good idea. I think that women's approach to, to relationships, I use the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love, but I think that it could make a huge difference. Now, in a patriarchal, patriarchal society like the Middle East, an awful lot of women are probably going to get hurt if they were to begin to assert themselves, but nevertheless, I think I mean, you guys come up with a better answer of what the problems in the Middle East are and let me know what it is. Okay, thank you. How about land southeast? Say again? Land southeast in Izmir. Yeah. Is it still a, uh, a go? Huh. I don't think it's there. I think it's moved to, to Naples. Land southeast headquarters in Izmir used to be a huge NATO headquarters. Um, I think it moved to Naples quite some time ago, actually, inshallah. You know, before the next question, yeah, do you know the answer to that question? Yes. Okay. What is it? <laughs> here, I have the mic here. Uh, there, there is a command uh, in Izmir. Uh, it's not land southeast anymore, but it's, it's the land command. So the, the land component command that was in Heidelberg ah, okay. moved to Izmir, uh, several years ago, and it, it's still it's it's commanded by a U.S. three star. Oh, really? Uh, well. Okay. Yes, sir. But isn't land southeast in or something is in Naples? Uh, well, uh, joint force, uh, joint forces command Naples, um, or joint forces command South is in Naples. Okay. So there's JFC Naples and JFC Brunson. Okay. Uh, for NATO, the two. Well, Turkey is still a member of NATO. That's important that you all know that, and we are still guided by Article 5, which is an attack on one is an attack on all. So, and that, that's still the guide, the guiding uh, article of uh, military cooperation in Europe. Incidentally, before we have any more questions, I just want to tell you that in addition to the Turkey uh, article, which is very good, and Tashpinar, I, I know, I met him, but the opening essay at the very beginning of the book called the Great War, Woodrow Wilson, and the Foreign Policy Association. I commend that article to you because it is an impassioned plea for continued U.S. involvement in the world. And not just military involvement, but diplomatic and democratic ideals uh, exposition in the world. It's really a good article by the current head of the Foreign Policy Association. So, okay. Thank you for all the information. Um, <clears throat> basically, it's widely known that uh, Turkey has supported the rebellion in Syria. And um, they have let in uh, rebels coming through their borders. Uh, at this point in time, they really have no friends. The Tur Turkey went from zero enemies to zero friends in a matter of uh, a couple of years. Uh, where do you see the relationship with Iran uh, today, now that Iran is totally supporting Bashar Assad in this conflict? There are so many conflicting relationships uh, in all of this. You're correct that uh, Iran and the Hezbollah, which is the Iranian guards in 
Lebanon are supporting Bashar al-Assad, who, by the way, is Shiite. Uh, it's Alawite, and it's a little derivative of Shiism, but, but uh, Bashar al-Assad is Shia, and that's... And, of course, Iran is playing its fingers in every pie kind of a role in the Middle East, and uh, so it will continue. Having said all that, the commercial relationship between Iran and Turkey is very strong, and there is a significant amount of... Uh, interactive economic exchanges and contracts and and so on between Iran and Turkey and, and Iran continues uh, to be a source of, uh, of fuels uh, to Turkey so and and the one place perhaps where the Turks don't have to worry about the Kurds is in Iran because the Iranian government controls that element of their population fairly fairly well. Um, I think the one thing that brought all Islamic nations in the Middle East together was this move by, by the U.S. to recognize Jerusalem and move the uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. That is an absolute, uh, from the perspective of any Islamic country, no matter what their sectarianism might dictate uh, they are uh, they are very much against that um, Iran is Shia uh, Turkey is Sunni there's that basic sectarian divide which uh, in the past you could have well argued that Turkey is not very good Sunni and but uh, they're getting back to a more uh, Islamic oriented uh, influence on society and government. So, yeah, just like everything else in the Middle East, it's, it's difficult to, to say what's, what's next uh, in the re relationship. Uh, very difficult. In terms of friends, that's interesting that you say they have no friends whatsoever. Uh, I downloaded an article uh, this morning from the Middle East Institute that said that Turkey has made two very good friends. Gutter and Sudan. Uh, now, you know, in terms of moving south and east a little bit, um, Turkey's foreign policy may well be oriented in that direction in the near future, both economically and diplomatically. The idea of pan Ottomanism, the reestablishment of the Ottoman Empire, is ludicrous. I mean, the Arabs would have absolutely nothing to do with that. But <clears throat> Having said that, Turkey may be focusing on Tunisia, Sudan. They're, they're going to build a port in Sudan, which they say is to expedite the pilgrims who want to go to Mecca through there. Mm. It's an extension of uh, Turkey's, probably their military, as well as other influences uh, in, that, in the Red Sea. And uh, so it's fairly well calculated. But you're right. They've, they've alienated a significant portion of the what used to be friends or at least cooperating countries in the region. And uh, Mr. Erdogan at work. Yeah, uh, in your uh, opinion, uh, do you think it's still safe for Americans to go to Turkey, especially the larger cities? And uh, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what do you think coming up in the near future as far as that would be concerned? I'm asked that question probably more than any other question that friends ask. And, you know, the Ephesus trips with the, the cruises that come in there and go up to see Ephesus and Ephesus and... Uh, well, I was going to go last May, and my the guy who's the pastor of Second Presbyterian Church was going with me, and we were going to do the seven churches, the seven churches of Revelations. We were going to go to all of them. We were advised by good sources not to do that, so we canceled it. Um, 
the incredible thing about it, I mean, if you are just a pure tourist and you have no background or history with Turkey, I would say that if you go with a reputable tour company and you're going to stick your nose in at Izmir or Ephesus or, you know, I don't really think you're in significant uh, danger per se unless you have some kind of a crazy who's attacking Americans, which hasn't happened yet uh, as far as I know. So I would say that you can still visit Turkey under very controlled circumstances. I certainly would not go into the hinterland. I would stay on the coasts, uh, Istanbul, Izmir, perhaps uh, Antakya or Marmis on the south coast. But, you know, don't venture forth and certainly forget about uh, Gurame or, uh, or Konya or any of those places in the southeast. I forget that to totally. But having said that, the coastal areas, I think, are still safe. Now, for any of us who have a history with Turkey, we might be on a list. And uh, that's another reason why I'm not anxious to go there right now. I know a good friend of mine, also a military attaché, who did, after retirement, attend several of the Glenist uh, meetings here in the United States and went to Turkey with the Glen Travel Group on three different occasions, including the governor of Mississippi went with him on one occasion. Uh, he's not going back for a while. Sir? Would you happen to know if any of our former war college students from Turkey were caught up in that military coup and are in jail? The number one question on my uh, list, and I have inquired of State Department agency, and I tried to find out something from the Foreign Affairs Office down in the uh, Axie in the Army. Chief Staff Intelligence in Washington. The best answer I got was right from here, the guy over here at the War College, the, the guy who's in charge of the uh, international relations, the IF office. Um, he said that as far as he knows, and he still gets uh, end of year greetings, Christmas, New Year's greetings from a large segment of the former officers who attended school over here. And he said, I've always gotten a whole bunch of cards right around the end of the year. And this year he says he didn't get any from Turkey. Now, I have no knowledge of any actions against those officers, whether they are still on active duty or they've been dismissed or I don't know. And this group of guys that I, guys and gals that I meet with who are all former State Department attaches, agency folks, we meet frequently. Uh, none of them know the answer because I've emailed all of them and asked them that very question. Bob, I was wondering um, if you could give us some thoughts on the Gullness movement and whether it is really a movement that's a democratic movement, the Gullenist. Yeah, okay. Whether it's a democratic movement, uh, how are the current policies in our country sort of affecting that movement? Uh, and sort of can we view that as a viable option that we can support in terms of democracy? The current surface, well, the surface response to that question is that Gulen preaches a moderate Islam. <clears throat> adhering to basic democratic norms, focus on the poor, charitable work, and education. That all sounds really, really good. The subsurface, and some say the black side to, to Glenn's thought processes and, and ultimate goals is to gain control of the government in Turkey. And in fact, he was heading that direction in 2013. Um, it, it, I mean, he has friends in Congress and in the State Department and in state governments all over the place. He conducted hundreds of tours to Turkey with people in 
semi-important local positions, not necessarily huge shakers and movers, but nevertheless a significantly influential group in this country. As I said, he has over 100 charter schools here. And I, somebody asked me during the break if he was receiving public funds now from Betsy DeVos and the, uh, and the Department of Education. I thought, nah, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I would expect that within the context of however charter schools are being supported in this country, it may well be that public funds are, are involved. For a student to attend one of Gulen's charter schools, up until recently, it was pretty expensive. They wear uniforms, the kids are disciplined, it's, you know, all kinds of good stuff that you would think of from the past, at least in terms of education. But, but uh, he's a mystery. Uh, he remains so. I should have said in terms of the extradition request that fair trial issue is there, evidence that he actually was commanding and controlling the military coup, both needs to be considered by the Justice Department. The other issue is that Glenn's got a lot of friends in the U.S. government. Everybody plays golf with somebody. That's an old, <laughs> <laughs> that's an old, old uh, issue in terms of friendship. Yes, sir. I teach as an adjunct in the D.C. area, so I have a lot of international students. Recently, I had three students from Turkey, two male and one female. And anecdotally, I observed that these three students were very highly motivated, willing to take a leadership role and give optional student presentations, and in general had a very strong work ethic. So in the spirit of Hofstede is cultural constructs as opposed to stereotypes, what would you describe as the work ethic of Turkish young people especially? Uh, hmm. Hmm. Think about that for a minute here, a second. Um, they have a, a huge, at the moment, I think 25% unemployment rate under people under 25. Um, they have a highly educated base in Turkey. I mean, mandatory education through the eighth grade uh, and a lot of post-secondary education opportunities, which a great number of students have taken advantage of. Um, professionally, uh, their success in Turkey is unfortunately tied to their political affiliation at the moment. And if they are, if they are affiliated with a non-AKP uh, party, they probably are not going to succeed all that great. As far as the work ethic is concerned of just the general citizen, I would say it is as good or better than other semi-developed or developed nations in the world. Uh, there's a great little uh, comment that you make when you walk past somebody who is exerting themselves physically in, in work. And you say, kolai gel sin, which means hopefully it'll come easily. And, and I would say that in Turkey 15 times a day. Uh, and, you know, I'd always get a smile. I'd always get a positive response. And, and they went back to digging ditches or whatever it was they were doing. Um, the rural population, which is still more than 50% of the population, although they have, there have been a significant move in, in toward the cities. But uh, you visit the village, people there are all working hard, and the women are working hard too. Sometimes I think the women were working harder than the men. And uh, uh, so the work ethic is, is uh, they're not lazy, uh, and they're not... Uh, they don't have their hand out expecting some kind of a uh, give out program. So I'd say it's probably pretty good. And I'm not surprised the students are good because they're usually the pick of the pick of the lot. Hi, sir. Mary Foster. Um, could you elaborate on the comment you started to make about us being blinded to the U to the uh, Turkish military's role? Um, I'd always understood them to be the defenders of secularism, and I don't really understand the Gulen relation is, relationship to, with them for the coup. Thank you. Mm. One of my pet topics for consideration at the moment, 
um, well, as far as the secularism is concerned, they were, they were charged by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk to be the protectors of the Turkish Republic. And there's a specific Article 35 in a document that was published in, well, I think 1935, I'm not sure, which charged the Turkish military with that role. And they have, the military has relied on that charge in 1960, in 1970, in 1980, in 1997, when the four times that they have directly involved themselves in, in overthrowing a government one way or another, a political element. Um, but my comment was made because I started going to Turkey in 72. I attended the Turkish War Academy as a student. I was really, really close with a 22 or 24 of the absolute cream of the crop of the Turkish young military at that time. As I say, Ilker Bashpu went on to be chief of the Turkish general staff and three other officers in my section all were promoted to four-star general, two of whom were in jail. Um, you know, uh, we military to military really thought highly of those guys, and they were accomplished people. They were erudite, they were historically smart, they were totally devoted, they were totally loyal, uh, patriots uh, to the nth degree. What we didn't properly consider is the fact that in a democracy, the military has to be subservient to civilian authority. And we never said that to them. We never, at least I never, and certainly most of the other US officers who were there never brought that up, never talked to them about hey, you know, really, you ought to be answering to a civil, civil authority. And um, I think that was a huge mistake. I think we should have been talking to them about that. And I don't know if it would have made any difference whatsoever, but, uh, but that's nevertheless, when I made that comment about how we had been very, very close, and we were, there were some other issues in the military-to-military -military relationship, which the Turks now bring up and talk to me about, which they never did at that time, like technology transfer. We sold them F-16s, but we didn't sell the radars that went with it. That ticked them off then, and it ticks them off even more now when they talk about it. Uh, so technology transfer was a huge issue. Um, we gave them secondhand stuff when we were operating a, uh, what do you call it, a, where you provide excess military gear. We gave them a lot of stuff that was, huh? yeah, foreign, mil foreign military assistance, MFMA, but a lot of it wasn't very good equipment. And they resented that. And I heard those stories later. I didn't hear them at the time. That's all part of it. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Can you identify a cause or an event that changed Erdogan from being a, a, a civil servant to an authoritarian? And secondly, what would be the implications of an independent Kurdish state in Iraq? No. Yeah. Huh? You only have 25 minutes. So. Yeah. Well, the KRG is an autonomous government in northern Iraq, and it has been that way since 93. And it is uh, autonomous unto a Kurdish government. Their relationship with Baghdad has been warm, not so warm, pretty cool, and outright antagonistic. Um, when they conducted this referendum in, when was that, September, October? for national independence, which was voted 92% favorable. I mean, the repercussions were immediate. There wasn't a single entity in the Middle East or the US or anybody else which supported that. The Turks were vehement about it, against it. 
nothing has happened since that referendum, and except that Mr. Barzani died, the guy who was the father of the movement died. Um, Baghdad reclaimed the Kirkuk uh, oil field and area, the, the, that is the Iraqi military forces. The possibility of a uh, independent Kurdistan anywhere in the Middle East is, in my opinion, impossible. These are four national entities, Syria, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. None of them wants to give up any territory to a Kurdistan. If the Kurds, Kurds want to go to China and establish a Kurdistan, that'd be okay with them, but not, not in the national territory that, where they currently live. So I think that's a non-starter. I'm actually lecturing over at the Messiah Pathways in March on Kurdistan, and uh, I'll, I'll be putting forth some of those ideas. What was your first question? That changed Erdogan. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I guess the question, you know, even in 2013, when I was there, I kept asking my Turkish friends, what does Erdogan want to accomplish? My t military friends were very sure that, you know, he just wanted to accomplish self-aggrandizement, power, authoritarianism, and that's all he wanted from the start. My academic friends, when I would talk to them, they'd say, well, he started out endorsing the idea of democratic Islam, that Islam could coexist and, and operate within a context of a democratic principles. But over time, he began to believe that wasn't true, that they couldn't, that, that a, uh, the continuance of government with separation of powers, with freedom of assembly, with freedom of speech, freedom of religion, you know, in time, he said that wasn't working. And he became more authoritarian in that in the first place. But then, when the Gulen movement began to show its stripes, so to speak, in terms of attempting to remove Mr. Erdogan from government and power and take over themselves, well, he became adamant about, I'm in charge, I'm going to decide to hell with everybody else, I'm, I know better. And, and so I don't know if there was a single point at which he converted from democratic principles to Erdoganism. I don't know if he ever really believed in the democratic principles to start with, but he espoused them. Uh, but that's where we're at right now. It certainly was an evolution. It might have been a revolution, but nevertheless, it's, it's where we are right now. Yes, sir. Th thanks for a very good uh, presentation. So my question is the relationship between Turkey and Russia. So my understanding is that Turkey is sort of co-sponsoring the Syrian negotiations in Astana with Russia. They recently bought the missile defense system from Russia. Uh, I'm, I'm curious as to the nature of Turkish cooperation with NATO, naval operations in the Black Sea. I mean, you know, I'm just, how all that's working out and is there any potential at all for Turkey to become like a Trojan horse uh, within NATO? I mean, I know they've got, they're not, they're losing interest in the EU. Is the potential for Turkey to lose interest in, in NATO because of their Russian relationship? Everything you said is correct, <clears throat> except one thing. The, the relationship between Russia and Turkey is absolutely a marriage of convenience. There is no love lost in either direction. The Turks are very wary of the Russians. They watched what's happened in the Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, they've uh, carefully uh, monitored Mr. Putin's uh, aggressive moves uh, throughout the uh, European area. And while Mr. Erdogan is a admirer of Mr. Putin's methodologies and, and character, uh, I would say that, that despite the fact of the S-400 by uh, the air defense system, um, that was kind of just irritation on, on Mr. Erdogan's part. He wanted to stick it in the eye of NATO, and, and he did it by buying a non-compatible air defense system. 
and the first deliveries began this week. Uh, so the relationship with, um, with Russia is careful and wary and commercial, and he'll use it in his relationship with the West. Now, bigger question, is it possible that Turkey could leave NATO? We've debated that within our little group. Does Turkey still have a strategic uh, interest in maintaining their defense relationship with NATO and Article 5? Article 5 is, even though it may have different interpretations, which it never did before, but it may have different interpretations in the Middle East context, um, there isn't any question about the fact that uh, Turkey would uh, well, no matter how mad they get at Europe, the, Europe is still their major commercial uh, trading partner, investment group. Uh, there's only so far they can go. And if they were to remove themselves from NATO, I think that that would be a, almost a step, a step too far. So I don't see that happening in the midterm. Who knows, you know? 10 years from now, 15 years from now, how they may perceive the relationships, especially if they develop these other relationships throughout the Middle East, the Sudan, Qatar, whoever, you know. The relationship with Sudan, by the way, has caused Egypt all kinds of heartburn. Of course, the Turks and the Egyptians were not getting along anyway because when they overthrew Morsi, that is the Egyptians, they got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood, which Erdogan favored. They, they had a policy of gradualism, in politics and social culture advancement, to Islamic social culture advancement. And Erdogan kind of agrees with that. And he was kind of an advocate of, uh, of Mr. Morsi. But General Sisi, who I guess you taught, among others, uh, <clears throat> had different ideas. He's, a, he's a very much in charge. He just changed his uh, foreign minister, I guess, and head of intelligence yesterday. So <clears throat> the answer to your question is I don't see them leaving NATO anytime soon. And they would not be a Trojan horse no matter what. They aren't that subtle. <laughs> uh, at the beginning of your presentation, um, you addressed the Gulan effect um, and the impact that he's had in the Turkish community in the state. Could you address the relationship between um, Erdogan and the mullahs and the religious, the Islamic community, if you will, um, knowing that Gulan probably has uh, a great impact still with the religious community. And there you have Erdogan, who at one time supported it, but now seems to has turned against them. Uh, what's that relationship and how does that work? Well, I didn't say in the lecture, but when the purge, the overall purge came, anybody who had affiliation with Gulen, including the mullahs, uh, and, and, and to be affiliated with Gulen, all you had to do was was have a connection with his with Gulen's uh, website. If you had if you had, had ever looked at Gulen's website on your computer, you were a Gulenist. Period. So uh, the mullahs were were definitively uh, uh, cleaned out as well as as everybody else. Now. Are there mullahs who still have Galenist leanings? Probably, but they're not very prominent because they wouldn't last very long if they did. Um, interestingly, though, that you bring up a point. How, how pure or real is Erdogan's Islam? What, how, how, is he a good Muslim? Well, he prays five times a day. He uh, it, it certainly uh, follows all the holidays. His wife wears a hajab, you know, the, the, the covering, the hair covering. Bottom line, I don't think he's guided much by Islamism in terms of his public direction of government. I don't think I would say that he's an Islamist at all in the sense of how he has uh, conducted policy. 
uh, over the last four or five years. That's what I said, that all of those isms went out the window. And now we have Erdoganism. And, and whatever characteristic within Erdoganism that you could attribute to Islam, well, that's okay. But he's not an Islamist. Not, not a radical Islamist and certainly not even a, a significant exporter of Islam at this point in time. Yes, thank you. You said that Erdogan was good at winning elections. He what? You said he was good at winning elections. Yeah. And you said he was taking over the media. But how strong is this actual, what you call, grassroots support within Turkey? I mean, does he have a quarter of the personality, or how strong is he actually? Himself? He could lose this election. He could actually lose this election. In, I mean, he only got 51.79% of the popular vote when he ran for president in 2014. <clears throat> the constitutional referendum in 2017 passed by a, a similar number. That's only 2% of the vote uh, that could switch. And if, and if an increasing number of citizens <clears throat> were to be turned off by his authoritarianism, he could actually lose this vote in in the next election. It's not scheduled until November of 2019, but again, he can call snap elections any time that he has a mind to do so when he thinks it's favorable from his point of view politically. And several uh, people, Gonel Tour, who is the head of the Turkish department at the Middle East Institute, she firmly believes that he's going to call snap elections in July of this year uh, for both parliament and the president. And, uh, you know, she's basing that on what she perceives to be his ability to win that election. But uh, he could lose. And if he loses, what goes, what happens? Oh, good Lord. I mean, there's, there's just no way in the world to put together a government, I don't think. Um, you have the nationalists, you have the Kurdish population, you have the CHP, which is center left. Uh, and, a, and a variety of other interests. The E Party, there's a new party called the E Party. E means good, I-Y-I, -I, the good party, headed by a female, by the way, a uh, female deputy. And it's making inroads. It's actually uh, looks like it might have some impact, let's put it that way, within an election cycle. So, you know, if Erdogan does not win, it would be bad. If Erdogan wins, it will be bad. Um, that's about it. I'll get you next. On this same topic, is this a country where we could um, respect and, and think that the election results are always honest? I mean, could he control the election so that he's bound to win? Yeah, that, that's a really a good question, and I should have said something about that. Um, there have been irregularities, local irregularities in the voting process even in the past, but for the most part, the international observers who come in to watch have certified the elections as ultimately the correct winner won. And uh, so in the ultimate sense, the elections are fair. Will future elections be fair? And with Erdogan's absolute control of this media um, adherent section of the media, which includes TV stations and newspapers, numerous newspapers, and some of the stuff they publish is just mind-boggling. It's so totally imaginative and, and, and conspiracy-laden, and it's just awful stuff that they publish, and, you know, they quoting government sources. Uh, so future elections, I would say, are going to deserve careful observation. And if it's a close election, like it could be, 
uh, even even closer observation and and certification in the aftermath. But it's it's a danger. It's a concern. It's something we ought to keep an eye on. You had a question. He had a question here. You get him while he. Okay. Uh, her question was my question, so I'll ask it a step further. Does his ironclad, if that's an appropriate adjective, control over politics at the national level permeate to politics at local levels? Does, yeah, do, do his control at the national level uh, continue on and uh, permeate down at the lower levels? Well, in fact, there are local elections that are separate from the national elections where the mayors are elected and uh, local prosecutors and so on. And the AKP has been very strong in that arena as well. And that has pretty much mirrored the national election results. Um, I think the answer to your question is yes, it has permeated. Uh, the AKP has, has very significant control. And Erdogan knows how to do this, how to put locals in charge of, of uh, election cycle um, bureaus that go out and talk to the people and advertise and pass out brochures and do all of that kind of stuff, electioneering, if you will. And they do it very well. And uh, so I think the answer to your question is yes. Yes, sir. What do you see? You said if he's elected, it's bad. If he fails to get reelected, it's bad. What do you foresee other than bad for the next five years well, or so? Uh, 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 and, hopefully, and may, uh, uh, would you care to comment on the relationship between Turkey and the U.S. in the next five years? Well, I was Thank being you. a little bit facetious in saying bad and bad. I mean, it's there's lots of negative aspects to both election results. Let's put it that way. That's, that's a better way of phrasing it. As far as U.S. and Turkey's relationship in the next five years, I don't think it's going to get better. Um, if, in fact, today, as we speak, Turkish forces are intervening in that section of, of Syria there, opposite Hatay province, uh, against the Kurdish elements in Afrin, Afrin, A-F-R-I-N, and Manjib, which is another uh, Syrian town where the YPG is very much in charge. If Turkish ground forces cross into Syria, if Turkish air forces um, cross over and begin bombing, uh, Assad has said he's going to oppose any Turkish intervention involvement in Syria. He said he's going to bring the full force of, uh, of Syrian armed forces to oppose the Turks. And the chief, did I say this? The chief of Turkish general staff and the intelligence chief were in Moscow yesterday, uh, supposedly getting Russian clearance. And then there's an article in the paper, which I downloaded just before I came here, that said that the Russian police forces in those areas are vacating. They're leaving. So, um, and if U.S. special forces happen to be there with the, uh, they could actually end up fighting the Turks. You think the relations are going to get any better? I don't think so. Not for a while. All right, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the group, Bob, thank you for your presentation and bringing us up to date on Turkey. <laughs> Here I have a little something as a uh, thank you gift from us. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Bob. <laughs> Me too, for a lot of reasons, because <laughs> that would impact this program. Uh, as we wrap up